Hawaii, a land rich in legend. Some of it ancient, some of it very new. My name is Charles Lee, and my love for animals has taken me around the world. But sometimes, the most amazing animal adventures can be found in your own backyard, Kalihi Valley. For almost a century, rumors persist of strange creatures on its slopes, creatures that should only exist on a continent thousands of miles away. And here's where our journey begins. Right behind us is the Leaky Lake Highway, and as dangerous as it was crossing that, ascending these slopes is going to be even more treacherous. The stones are slippery with mold, the soil is loose, the slope is steep, and sometimes you can't even see where you're stepping. It's going to be even a whole lot worse coming back down. So, don't try this at home, never attempt an expedition without the proper training and physical conditioning. Alright, let's get started. Hey! Okay, let's go. Of course, simply finding these animals won't tell us everything about them. For more information, we need guidance from the people who know them intimately. I'm Ron Walker. I'm a wildlife biologist. When I was the district biologist for Oahu, we had a visiting scientist from back east who was a mammologist, and he said, could he come here and study the wallaby? And I said, well, sure, I'm getting a lot of questions about it. We need some help. So he and I did some research back in the 60s and uh, actually caught them, trapped them, and uh, banded them to see, to identify each one. They were brought into Hawaii in 1916 by a private owner in Kalihi, and he wanted to have a private zoo, so he brought in a male, a female, and a joey, a young one. Well, unfortunately, the next day, some dogs came, neighborhood dogs came, and chased away the male and female. And that is the origin of the wallabies in Hawaii. They uh, escaped uh, Aleva Heights, uh, is where they were, and from there they spread all over that part of the island. Dogs continue to remain a threat to the wallabies. In fact, whenever they leave the safety of their cliffs to forage for food down below, wallabies become susceptible to the three H's. Hounds, highways, and hunters. There is a mortality on the wallaby from time to time. They come down to the Kalihi Cliffs to Likiliki Highway and they get hit by cars. And people call us up and say we found a dead wallaby. So we, we know that that's part of the mortality, and we also found out that uh, pig dogs, dogs that uh, hunters use to hunt pigs, uh, sometimes get loose up there and they go after the wallabies, just a natural instinct. So a lot of wallabies are lost that way. Even with Ron's help, this is still like looking for a needle in a haystack. But maybe the wallabies themselves can offer a few clues as to how to find them. This place is a literal jungle, but if you know where to look, the wallabies have already cleared game trails for us to explore this forest. Unfortunately though, these animals are only two feet tall, so most of the time you have to be crawling on your hands and legs. Lucky for me though, I like it on all fours. Wait, that, that came out wrong. These trails are cleared as the wallabies search for food. But chances are they're not eating Australian shrubbery. So, to take a look at what's going into these wallabies, I have to take a look at what's coming out of them. They might be difficult to spot at first, but once you know what to look for, you'll find that this area is actually covered in the poop of the animal we're after. If you break it open, you'll find that inside isn't meat or flesh, but actually vegetative matter and grasses. And, more importantly, in here is a Christmas berry. That definitely implies that it's a wallaby because precious little else will eat these berries. But Christmas berries aren't the only thing they have to eat and I soon come across something more plentiful and even tastier. Most of you are probably aware of this by now, but strawberry guava is a very invasive species. And one of the reasons why it's so invasive is because it's tasty to a lot of animals, including pigs and wallabies. 
and after being digested and pooped out, the seeds actually have what they need to sprout and grow even faster than normal. And that's a really big problem here. Obviously, the wallabies are probably responsible for this making its way up to higher elevations, but since the wallabies are only confined to Kalihi, by and large, this is the work of pigs. We do have efforts to try and eradicate strawberry guava across the island. Unfortunately, it's met with a lot of opposition. We need to continue to educate people and let them know that if you do like strawberry guava, just grow it in your garden. Don't make it grow in everyone else's. But with so much strawberry guava, there's probably another introduced mammal in the area. Well, it's good to know I'm not the only person up here. So recreational hikers will sometimes use this trail all the way up to Bowman, despite the fact that this is the most unkept and dangerous trail in the entire Koala range. But more importantly, it's also used by pig hunters, as you can tell from this jaw here. Uh, looks like uh, whoever shot this piggy took out the tusks as a keepsake and just left the jawbone to hang here as a trail marker. Very nice. I hope they don't do that with the wallabies. Wallabies are actually protected. They are listed as a game mammal, just like feral pigs, but hunting on the wallabies is prohibited. The season is permanently closed. What I'd like to do with feral pigs is actually take them off the game mammal list completely and just label them an invasive pest or an exotic animal. As we explore further, we find further signs of pigs on the slope, but there are still areas that not even they can reach. Gazing up at these rocks, it's easy to see how these animals managed to remain so reclusive over the years. Pretty much nothing with short of a wallaby has arms and legs dexterous enough to scale this sheer rock face. I'm tempted to actually take a go of it myself, but... Well, two things. One, I don't want to risk encroaching on their lair. This is their sanctuary. This is their habitat. More importantly, though, I'm pretty sure not all of these rocks can actually support the weight of a human being. And in fact, this trail is actually dotted with small stones and boulders that have come loose over the years and actually kept rolling down the entire slope until they crashed into the base of a tree, where they're still held in place today. And these are the small ones. These are the tiddler boulders. I'm sure most of you are aware that this past month, a couple of the larger ones, I'm talking minivan size large, came loose and actually did a number of damage on several homes in this area. In fact, thinking about that right now makes me wonder if this is actually the safest place for us to be at this current time. I think it's time we took a detour. I pointed out how difficult it was. They're in a very steep cliff area, they're very difficult to get at. Could be dangerous going up and down. You either got to, you probably use ropes to find them in their, where they're centered. All right, we're now situated on one of the ledges opposite of their cliffs where we should have a straight view of them without obstructing their daily lives. Unfortunately, though, the lens on the video camera isn't powerful enough to get a close up. The good news is, though, I do have my camera with a telephoto lens, and with any luck, this should get us a nice close-up of these animals. Based on the work of Skip Lazell and Ron Walker, we do know these brush-tailed rock wallabies are a bit larger than their Australian ancestors. Now, it might just be that they're inbred. But it's also possible that this diet of strawberry guava and Christmas berries has allowed them to grow faster and larger than the original Australian population. Whatever reason, natural selection has steered them towards island gigantism. Now what I would like to do, however, is someday compare these animals, not just to their Australian counterparts, but to other colonies of rock wallabies that have found homes on other locations in the globe. New Zealand actually has several colonies that are a bit more prolific than the Kalihi species. In fact, they're being considered pests right now. They tried removing the animals back to Australia and now they've begun active hunting of the wallabies to keep them under control. In addition, as recently as last week, some animals did escape from a private home in Scotland. So it would be fun to see how that develops. It's, it's a rock wallaby. So over the years, from 1916 to now, uh, they've been sighted primarily in the Kalihi area, but also up near Triple Hospital, 
uh, on both sides of Kalihi, Hi uh, Kalihi Highway Valley, and uh, so they had a much wider distribution at one time. But at the time of our study, they were pretty much concentrated in that one little colony uh, above in Kalihi. As the 100th anniversary of their time here draws near, the future of these tiny denizens of Kalihi Valley remain unclear. What is certain, though, is that for the time being, they'll continue to inspire the imaginations of those who know they still live up here on the rocks.